welcome in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We gather together today to uplift him and to glorify our God for the great and wonderful things that he has done. So let's, um, if you have a mobile phone, please uh, turn it off or on silent so that we're not interrupted. And then if we could open with a word of prayer. Lord, we do indeed thank you for this and other opportunity to gather together with other people that, that know and love you. And I pray that you would indeed accomplish your purposes in each and every heart and life today. We thank you for those that are, are present here. We pray for others that are not able to be here today, but that you would um, also work in, in their lives. And uh, Lord, we just pray that in all that we say and do, that our Lord Jesus would be magnified and that our hearts would be drawn closer to him and that we would live more in the light of what he has done for us and what his purposes are for us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, just a couple of announcements about uh, weekly activities. The uh, outreach on Wednesday morning at 10 o'clock, I understood that they could use some help setting things up, tables and chairs. Uh, Nolene's not here this morning, but it, I, I just wanted to say this is a, a good opportunity for us to extend friendship and loving care to those of our community, those in our neighborhood. And uh, if you would be willing to help out, Nolene's not here this morning, but speak to Diane, her, her right-hand woman. Um, and, uh, or, or another thing, um, if you'd be able to pick people up. And we, we do thank uh, those that are involved in the ministry of picking people up and bringing them to church and bringing them to other things. And, uh, if you could help out with that, that would be appreciated as well. Um, Bible studies, uh, Wednesday night at 7.30. Uh, we're in Mark chapter 9, the latter part of uh, Mark chapter 9, and uh, Thursday morning, Proverbs 16. 16? All right. So um, if you're able to take part in those, I would encourage you to do so and uh, also our Saturday morning prayer meeting as we pray for our church, pray for one another, and that the Lord would use us for his glory in this community. I believe that's all of the announcements that I need to make, but as we uh, prepare our hearts to worship the Lord, consider these words from Psalm 104. And, and as I read these, I want you to think about what these words tell us about who God is. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with honor and majesty, who cover yourself with light as with a garment, who stretch out the heavens like a curtain. Verse 10, he sends the springs into the valleys, which flow among the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field, and the wild donkeys quench their thirst. By them the birds of the heavens have their habitation. They sing among the branches. He waters the hills from his upper chambers. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your works. He causes the grass to grow for the cattle and vegetation for the service of man that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine that makes glad the heart of man, oil to make his face shine and bread which strengthens man's heart. Verse 24, O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your possessions. Verse 27, these all wait for you that you may give them their food in due season. What you give them, they gather in. You open your hand, they are filled with good. You hide your face, they are troubled. You take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. 
You send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the earth. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. He looks on the earth and it trembles. He touches the hills and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. May my meditation be sweet to him. I will be glad in the Lord. May sinners be consumed from the earth and the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. A psalm that speaks of God as the creator, and because he's the creator, all things belong to him. And he's also the sustainer, the one that provides the needs of all. Our very lives are under his care and his control. And at the end, he gives his conclusion, I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. My meditation of him will be sweet. I will be glad in the Lord. When we think about it, we have much to praise the Lord for. Many times we focus on what we wish were different, the things that seem wrong in this sin-cursed world. But we need to remind ourselves to be glad in the Lord. And as the psalmist said, bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. And we're going to do that this morning as we sing our first song, The Heavens Shall Declare the Glory of the Lord. Let's be upstanding as we sing. saying what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. And the Lord works a transformation in people as we put our trust in him.
trust that is true in your life, that there has been a change because Jesus has come to live within you. This month we're meditating on and hopefully memorizing uh, a verse from Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 2. Let's say it together. Hebrews 12, 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Remembering that one who is sitting there at right the right hand of the throne of God. And he's our advocate. And um, he hears our prayers. And so uh, we're going to go to him in prayer and uh, ask his blessing on our church and uh, the, the ministry of the word of God. You can just come on in. Welcome. And I've asked John to uh, begin our prayer time, and uh, then others, if you would like to, uh, to pray, feel free to, and if no one's praying out loud, pray in your heart, and uh, we can bring our requests before the Lord, and after two or three have prayed, I will uh, conclude our time in prayer. Thanks, John. Our Heavenly Father, and Almighty God. Lord, we come to your throne of grace, and we thank you, Lord, that we can come to your throne of grace openly and freely through the price that was paid by your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Lord, you loved us so much, and he loved us so much, that he came down to earth. Lord, we can never say thank you enough. We ask, Lord, and we thank you, Lord, that we can bring our petitions before you. Lord, we, we, before that we give our thanks, Lord. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for the way you care for us, you provide for us. And we ask, Lord, that you'll be good enough to use us, that we, through you, may be blessing to others. Lord, we... We pray, Lord, for our church here. We thank you, Lord, that you're here with us at all times. We thank you, Lord, that we only have to turn to you. We need to turn to you for guidance. We know you bless us, Lord, but we ask that you guide us and show us how you want to use us. We pray too, Lord, that we know that some of our members are away or ill but we ask Lord that they may know your care your love and know that your loving arms are around Lord we we pray for our families some of a lot of our families like my son they don't know Christ as their saviour but we commit them all to you Lord and also our wider family we pray for this area. We have started a small outreach through our coffee and cake. But we ask Lord that for your blessing on that, that we may be used to reach the area here. Not for our benefit, but Lord, that for their benefit, that they may come come to you and know that ultimately we all need salvation. We all need to know Christ as our Saviour. So we, we pray for each other, Lord, that you'll uphold us and use us and bless us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
for the answers to our prayers and we commit those in our families who are struggling with health issues at this point in time that uh, you will draw them near to yourself and give the doctors wisdom as they care for them. And we thank you for the work that is going on in uh, places of turmoil in this world in spite of what the evil one would do. You are drawing um, men and women to yourself and we think of the uh, work in Moldova and the Ukraine and, and the refugees that have moved into Armenia over the last few months added to the needs that are there for the those who are in, in our, from our point of view, living uh, below the poverty line. And we just thank you for the work of your spirit that is going on amongst the young people in uh, Moldova. And we thank you too for those who are serving you in Colombia, for Bob and Lynn, as they continue to serve you there. And the, their desire for leadership for another assembly in that area. And so we give you our thanks that in spite of the turmoil and the rebellion of mankind <coughs> against you, we thank you that you will fulfill your purposes according to your eternal perspective. And so we give you our thanks for the blessings that come to us from day to day. And we acknowledge our dependence upon you and your spirit for anything that will be accomplished uh, through our collective service together. And we thank you for the blessing of teaching of the truth that we enjoy from week to week. And we pray that you will help us to apply it to our own lives and to our own situation as we put our trust in you because you are King of Kings and Lord of Lords and your will will be accomplished. So help us keep our trust and our eyes upon you and we give you our thanks for your love in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, I just want to praise you and thank you for our church family. And Lord, I really pray that you will bring just some younger folk into our congregation so that, um, Lord, as a lot of us are getting older, we need some young blood to continue the work here. And we thank you for everyone that's so involved in the different works that they're, they're doing. We just want to praise you and thank you for each one. Lord, we do thank you that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens and that our Lord Jesus, who loved us and gave himself for us, sits there to make intercession for us. And because of that, we can come to you to a throne of grace. We come not because of who we are. None of us are very significant in the eyes of this world. All of us fall short of the standard that you have set, but because we are accepted in our Lord Jesus, we can come before you and ask that you would meet the needs and the things that are on our hearts. We pray for those of our congregation that are not well. We pray for 
Dennis and Norma, who we understand are both in the hospital at the moment. We, we just pray for them, for um, your grace to be with them at this particular time. But there are others of our number, even some who are sitting here today, who struggle with various physical ailments and our bodies that, that struggle as we, as we age. We recognize that this world is under the bondage of corruption, that because of the curse of sin, we live in a world that is, that is broken. But Lord, help us to live in the light of the world that is to come. Thank you for the promise of your word that there is a better world to come where all things will be made new. And Lord, we look forward to that day and help us to live not for the here and now, but to lay up our treasures in heaven, to seek the things that are above. And Lord, help us to see the importance of spiritual needs. We've already prayed for those of our, of our families who don't know you and are not walking with you. Lord, help us to see the needs of people around us who don't know Christ, who are lost and facing judgment and condemnation. Lord, give us opportunities to speak. Give us the courage to speak and to share the things that you are doing in our lives, the changes that you have made in, in our lives. And Lord, work in us to use us as your witnesses in this world for the glory of Christ. May we be salt and light in the world around us that others may come to see the glory of our Lord Jesus and put their faith and trust in him. And we ask all these things in his precious name. Amen. We're going to sing once more before Hayden comes and brings the message this morning. Ancient words, holy words long preserved for our walk in this world. Let's stand together, stand together as, as we see. <laughs>
be seated. And I'm going to pray just before Hayden comes. And I trust that what we've just sung is true, that you've come with an open heart to receive the ancient words that have been written centuries ago, but they're God's words. And may he impart to us the truths that he wants us to know. Lord, thank you that you have seen fit to preserve your word. Down through the centuries, people have taken a stand to hand on to us the truths of your word. And as we open them this morning and study the things that were written long ago, may you, by your Holy Spirit, speak through these things. I pray for her brother Hayden that you would uh, fill him with your Holy Spirit and enable him to clearly communicate the message that you have for us today and give us ears that are ready to receive the things that you will uh, have for us today. We ask these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Special thanks to those who came knowing I was speaking. <laughs> we thank you for that. Um, we're going to look at Daniel today. Um, last time I spoke, I spoke about the importance of all the Christians to share their faith, and I diverted. So we're back on Daniel, and I'm going to be looking at, at chapter 5. And in a moment, I'm going to get Matthew to come up and read the portion we're going to look at. But just before we do that, for those who have not been here or those who like me have a bad memory I'd like to just bring you up to date to where we're at and in chapter 1 we talk, Daniel wrote about how the uh, Iraqi nation or then it was called the Babylonians invaded Israel and conquered Jerusalem and all, a lot of the people were taken back to Babylon to live there and they became exiles in another country we read about that. Many of right to captured and brought back to Babylon, including Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Do you want to say those names? <laughs> Very good. Yeah, if you can't, can't remember, then just mean, uh, make, shake your bed, make your bed to bed we go. That way you can remember. <laughs> um, and then Jesus, Jerusalem was to become a satellite city to Babylon. The king was taken away or he left without any power. Chapter 2 um, God actually raised up King Nebuchadnezzar to be this agent to, for God to punish and to teach Jerusalem a lesson. He rose him up. And uh, he was a particular very clever man from what we can gather. And uh, God gave him a specific prophecy in chapter 2. And it talks about that. And he talks about that, his kingdom, and how that he, and he gave him an image and he was to be the head of that image. And after he passed on, another nation called the Medio and the Persia, which is today Iran, next door neighbours, they've always been fighting, of course. And then after them, Greece and Rome were going to take over. And he gave them that message way back then. And in chapter 3, uh, then Nebuchadnezzar got a bit carried away with that dream. He thought, oh, well, I like that idea. I'm going to make me a big image. And that dream came to his I'm going to make a gold image, 90 feet tall, and he made all the people bow down and worship him. But remember those three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they did not bow down to the idol. And God punished them for that. It was not a good thing to do. But all the people had to bow down and say, Great Nebuchadnezzar, he got a bit carried away. Then chapter 4, God decided to, to bring Nebuchadnezzar to a knowledge of himself. He was driven from the palace, and he got some kind of a de disease, we don't know what, is a form of dementia, I presume, but God brought it upon him, and he had to leave the palace, and you can look up in history, it doesn't talk about him doing this, but it says he was not well for a period of time. Seven years he became like an animal, for seven years he roamed out in the paddock, ate the grass with all the other animals. And after that period was over, Nebuchadnezzar, the king who hated God and did what nothing to do with God, said this, at this time had passed, I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked up to heaven, my sanity returned, and I praised and worshipped the Most High and honoured the one who lives forever. His rule is everlasting and his kingdom is eternal. I believe that we'll see Nebuchadnezzar in the glory when we arrive there. This great man, this very clever man, 
accepted God and came to the conclusion that God had to be God after all. All right, we're going to go, today is chapter 5, and I'm going to get Matthew to read verses 1 to verse 17. Now, this is about Belshazzar. Belshazzar, um, without going into too much detail, is Nebuchadnezzar's son. And he took over the role once Nebuchadnezzar died. And he, right, so there's about a 10 year gap between what we've just read, chapter 4 and chapter 5. So I'll just get Matthew to come up and read that for us. Thanks, Matthew. I'm going to read from 1 through 70. If you've got it, your Bible's open, please feel free. <coughs> King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that his father had taken from the temple in Jerusalem. So that the king and his nobles, his wives, his concubines and his guests might drink from them. So they brought in the gold goblets that had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem. And the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines drank from them. As they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver and bronze and iron and wood and stone. Suddenly, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall. Near the lampstand in the royal palace, the king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale, and he was so frightened that his knees knocked together and his legs gave way. The king called out for the enchanters, astrologers, and diviners to be brought and said to these wise men of Babylon, Whoever reads this writing and tells me what it means will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around his neck, and he will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. When all the king's wise men came in, they could not read the writing or tell what it meant. So King Belshazzar became even more terrified, and his face grew even more pale. His nobles were baffled. The queen, hearing the voices of the king and his nobles, came into the banquet hall. O king, live forever, she said. Don't be alarmed. Don't look so pale. There is a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. In the time of your father, he was found to have insight and intelligence and wisdom like that of the gods. King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father, the king, I say, appointed him chief of the magicians enchanters, astrologers, and diviners. This man, Daniel, whom the king called Belshazzar, was found to have a keen mind and knowledge and understanding, and also the ability to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve difficult problems. Call for Daniel, and he will tell you what the writing means. So, Daniel was brought before the king, and the king said to him, Are you Daniel, one of the exiles my father the king brought from Judah? I have heard that the spirit of the gods is in you, and that you have insight, intelligence, and outstanding wisdom. The wise men and enchanters were brought before me to read this writing and tell me what it means, but they could not explain it. Now I have heard that you are able to give interpretations and to solve difficult problems. If you can read this writing and tell me what it means, 
You will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around your neck, and you will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered the king, You may keep your gifts for yourself and give your rewards to someone else. Nevertheless, I will read the writing for the king and tell him what it means. O king, the Most High God gave your father Nebuchadnezzar sovereignty and greatness and glory and splendor. I've read too much, haven't I? Sorry. Good to see young people getting so involved they forget where they are in the Bible, isn't it? All right, um, we're going to just explain this. There's nothing complicated, no big words, which makes it easy for me. As I said before, there's approximately 10 years between what we read in chapter 4 and <laughs> chapter 5. We took, sang that song, Ancient Words. Well, this is approximately 553 BC. That makes it almost 3,000 years ago, but it is still relevant. All right, just to run through the story, then I want to apply it to us all, and I trust the Lord speak to all our hearts, because this whole story relates to everyone in this room. Belshazzar loved his parties. Most Australians do too. And he decided to have a big party for all his senators, for all the noblemen and all the party. And they're having a great party, drinking away. And as happen normally happens on most of these drinking parties, they get a bit carried away. Yeah, 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 yeah. how are you going, mate? Yeah, I'll give you my car. And next minute they've lost the car or something. And Belshazzar was going away and he said, oh, I've got an idea. He said, uh, go into my storeroom and bring from it the utensils that the Jews used to use in the holy temple back in Jerusalem. Bring them in and let's have some fun with them. And so the men went in and they brought them back and the king took these um, utensils. These, by the way, were ordered by God many years back in the days when uh, Moses was around and they had to produce these so that when the Jews worshipped they had to use these instruments and God dictated how they should be and nobody was to touch them at all other than the holy high priest and so Belshazzar got worn up he got wound up and said pray to the idols made of wood gold, silver he took God's special utensils and praised the very idols that God had condemned them for and uh, as they were doing this now having a great party, as most people do in these big parties, they slap one another, how are you going, mate, how's, isn't it wonderful world, isn't our wife wonderful, until tomorrow. And uh, <laughs> this is what happens at parties. And now they're getting on, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, the, the whole auditorium went quiet. And they all looked up, and they thought, gee, that must have been a strong drink. Um, what's that hand doing up on the wall? And here's a big human hand writing. And uh, everybody was quiet, and they suddenly realised it wasn't the drink. This was really happening. A man's hand was writing something up on the wall. And this is what it says, and uh, Matthew just read this, his face turned pale with fright. He got such a fright. His knees knocked. Mine couldn't, because I'm bandy. Um, <laughs> his knees knocked together in fear, and his legs gave way beneath him. It wasn't because he was drinking. It was because of the fear when he saw this hand, well, you can imagine if all of a sudden we're sitting here and up here, you know, a man's hand, half a man's hand, or just started writing on the wall. You'd say, what's going on here? I know technology's advanced, but that's a bit ahead of us. Um, and he didn't have to worry about that. But so the hand disappeared, the auditorium went quiet. They didn't know what to do, what to say. Nobody could read the writing. It was written up on there. And uh, they brought in the very clever men that could read these sorts of things. Nobody could. Until Nebuchadnezzar's wife, Belshazzar's mother, came in and said to the king, King, while your father was alive, there was a very smart man. He, won't be, he wasn't at the party. Men like him don't go to parties like this. They were useless and pointless. He was out. He wasn't, even though he's one of the top leaders at this time, in the country of Babylon. He didn't go to that party. And uh, the wife, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's, well, Belshazzar's mother said, look, get him. He's a man that has the spirit of God. He'll read that writing. So they brought in Daniel to make a long story and he will help you. 
So Daniel came in and reminded the king, and this is how brave Daniel is. He reminded the king of his father Nebuchadnezzar and how Belshazzar had not heeded the experience of his father. His father had been through a lot. God had humbled him for seven years. He saw his father live like animal out there and knew it was what God had planned. And as it went on, and he said, Belshazzar, you are his successor, and you knew all this, yet you have not humbled yourself. Fancy saying that to a king who is so all-powerful. Say that to Donald Trump and see how you go. Um, if you have proudly defied the Lord of heaven and have had these cups of his temple brought before you, you have defiled Almighty God. You should have known, but you didn't. So this is what it is. And Daniel looked up at the writing and all of a sudden he gave a, a very wry smile, no doubt. He knew that writing because it was this God that wrote that. He knew the writing of God. He looked up at it and this is what the writing said. This is the inscription that was written. Mine, mine, tekel you fasten. If my Kiwi accent sounds different, it may be different, but that's how we say it where we live in a country that speaks English without an accent. And, uh, <laughs> and this is what it says. Mini, mini, tekel you fasten. Nobody could read it because it was God's words, it was God's language. Now Daniel said, I will interpret this for you. Mine. God has numbered the days of your reign and has brought it to an end. Belshazzar, God has numbered you. Your days are over. God has said this. Tackle, you, Belshazzar, have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. You've not done your job as a king, Belshazzar. You've turned the people's hearts away from God rather than to him. And the last little section was, you fasten, or if you have a modern translation, it probably just fasten, but it doesn't really matter. Your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and to the Persians. Or your kingdom has been taken over from you. I'm going to hand it over to your neighbours, the Iranians. Well, that's what the Medes and the Persians were at that point of time. And uh, that very night, that very night of that party, the, uh, the Medes and the Persians invaded the city and without even fighting, they took command of the city. Historians tell us that the river Euphrates used to run under the walls of the Babylonian and they diverted the river and went underneath the walls. Whether that is the case, or I don't know, but the Bible tells us they took over. That very night, Belshazzar was killed. Belshazzar didn't get the message Daniel gave him. He didn't understand what Daniel was saying, even though it was clear. He was too proud, and he went to sleep that night instead of getting right with God. He should have got right with God. He, he should have thrown and said, no, God, I'm sorry. I'll change. I'll be a better king. He didn't. He went to sleep. You know why he went to sleep? Because he knew, or he thought he knew, nobody could possibly invade the the kingdom of Babylon because the Babylon walls around were so big that on the top of the walls you could ride, drive four chariots of horses abreast. That's how wide they were. And he thought there is no way anybody can invade my city. And he forgot the words of Daniel and forgot the words of that great hand even though he trembled at the time when he got it and they did nothing. Fellow Christians and those of you who are not, if you're here today, this is history. If you go onto Wikipedia, put in the word Belshazzar, put in the word Nebuchadnezzar, put in the word Babylon, you'll get this, you won't get this story because they don't like recording stories about God in objective history, do they? And this is what happened. What happened to Belshazzar is true of all of us in different ways. Belshazzar desecrated the holy utensils of the temple of God and used, worship, used to worship God, he used those and desecrated God. In the same way, our bodies have been created in the image of God and should be used to worship God. And rather than do that, we have used our bodies to do the opposite and bring the, God's name in vain. We're supposed to act like God. We are made like him. We're created like him. And yet, we see men and women who are promiscuous. We see marriages breaking up. 
We have people involved in sexual orgies. We see terrible programs on TV and on the internet. Man has desecrated this very body that God gave us to protect and to look after. God weighs, weighed King Belshazzar. And he said, you have, I have weighed you. He's not talking about his weight because <laughs> I'm very thankful for that part. He's not talking about weight at all. So those of you who've had more than you should have had, don't worry, I'm not going to get on about joining some diet or something. We've all been weighed and found to be wanting. This is a verse that we ought to be very wary of. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man sows, that he will also reap. You have been weighed, Belshazzar, and unfortunately, you're out of balance. Your balance is not coming up in the right way. It's not in your favour. The same thing is expressed in the New Testament, said a different way. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Belshazzar was weighed, and we're talking about his morality. We're talking about his moral integrity. He is weighed, and before a holy God, he is found to be out of balance. Unfortunately, not in his favour. In the New Testament, Paul says, Every man that's ever lived has sinned, and fallen short of the glory of God. Now in the old days, when they used to do the game of archery, they'd take an arrow and they'd shoot it at the target, and if it missed the target, someone would yell out, Sina, Mr. Mark. And that's what we all have done. All have sinned. So if you think you're one better than Belshazzar, you're not. You're probably better than me, that's not a very high standard, so you're okay there. But nevertheless, before a holy God, who, just, who judges good and evil, we all stand sh far short of the standard required. Um, the question then is, how can I tip the scales in my favour before a holy God? How can I make it that sin is outweighed by something better than sin? Now, there are a lot of common wrong thinking out there, and it, it is this, that a lot of people think that they can tip it by doing certain things. Moral perfection, if I do this, I'll be able to tip it. Some things that people th can think about that they think might tip the scales. Doing good stuff. If I go and help the blind. If I go and give ch money to the charity. If I give my flash sofa to the Sally's so they can use it to help some poor people. It will not tip the scales in your favor at all. Charitable work, church attendance. None of these will tip the scale in my favour or your favour. And by the way, all of us today have been weighed. God knows your heart. He knows when you're being yourself when nobody else is around. He knows your heart. He knows your thinking. He has weighed everyone here this morning. And he says, you are found wanting. Hayden Harvey, you are found wanting. And my question is, how can I tip it in such a way that I'm not found wanting before a holy God? This is what the Bible says. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest everyone should bo anyone should boast. The amazing thing about God, yes, he is holy. Yes, he demands moral justice. Yes, he demands perfection from all of us in our moral behaviour. We've all fallen short, but he says, but I will provide a way. He says, you can tip those scales in your favour. It is a gift. You can't earn it. Back in the old days, we used to talk about the golden rule. If we could just keep the golden rule, nobody can. Everyone has broken every one of those ten commandments that God gave us. Jesus stood on the scales on our behalf and tipped them in our favour, making us acceptable to God. Can I explain that simply? Almost 2,000 years ago, Jesus was born from Mary. Mary was a normal human lady. She was young. Yes, she was a virgin. God chose her to bear his son. Now, Jesus pre-existed his birth here. He lived in heaven with his father, but he dared to become a human being like you and I 
so that he could tip the scales at our behalf. See, I can't stand on t Tim's scales and tip them in God's favour. Because, mate, if I hopped on Tim's scales, I'd go further down. Um, nobody can stand on my other scales and say, Hayden, I'll stand in your place because you have your own sins. I have my own sins to pay for. That's why Jesus came, born as a baby, normal birth. And it says he lived a perfect life for almost 33 years he lived here on earth. He never told a lie. He was obedient to his parents. He did all the right things. He never committed the sin, as I just said. He healed people. He did only good. That's all he ever did, good, for three, approximately three years. People flocked to hear him. His enemies hated him because when people speak truth, it makes you feel uncomfortable. Nevertheless, in spite of what he did, he was arrested and put on the cross and died and took the sins of the world on him. Now, the co if we don't weigh up, if our scale is not in our favour, there's, there's a result. There's a punishment that comes with that. We have to pay for it. And as, Neb as Belshazzar found out, he had to pay that night for the fact that his scales were not in his favour. Um, this is a fantastic verse and one I... Um, use a lot and it's one we use in Japan a lot as well and they understand it funny enough. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. That's every human being that's ever lived. We do our own things. We have our own views. We argue because we want to protect me. It's all about me. We have turned everyone to his own way. All of us. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. What did what God did on that day when Jesus died on the cross on our behalf he took that balance that scales that the, the weight that Hayden Harvey had committed that tipped the, f the scales in not favourably for me he took them and placed them on Jesus the son of God on that cross it's just not a matter of Jesus dying on a cross almighty God, holy God who knows every sin that I've ever committed he took all those and the results of what I had to pay for, place them on Jesus and Jesus paid the lot for you. Isn't that amazing love? Because none of us have a right to stand before God. He did it. Now I, my scales now are tipped in my favour not because I'm good because you ask my wife, she'll give you a, a, a different view of me because of what God said, what God has done. In spite of the soldiers guarding the tomb, Jesus rose again, appeared to many, and many saw him and believed in him. If you want your scales, if you are aware of the fact that your scales are not measuring up to God's standards, they're not in your favour, God wants to make them in your favour by asking you to accept Jesus, his son, as your substitute. So that when he stands in the scales, they tip in God's favour and the weight of sin goes up and righteousness comes down if you can this is what we have to do if we confess with our mouth we've all got a mouth we eat with it, we talk with it if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead you will be saved saved from what? saved from the result of my scales not being in my favour Jesus took the price that I had to pay, that you had to pay, because he was the son of God, because he's eternal. He had the right to do that. The scales are tipped in your favour, is what that means. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now, I don't know everybody's heart here today. I can't read that. Only God can do that. But I have to ask you the question, in God's scales, where do you sit? If you've never accepted Jesus as your personal saviour, they're not in your favour. Everybody knows, I was just driving past, coming to church this morning, up by the Doyle lights here, there's a big sign that says eternity. Everybody instinctively knows that there's more beyond the grave. They know it. Um, uh, there was a, a, an interview on TV just the other day when they're talking to uh, 
a bad guy. I won't mention what sort of bad guy he was. But his mate had been killed. But I know where he is. The big man upstairs will be looking. Everybody instinctively knows there's more beyond the grave. And I can tell you, ladies and gentlemen, there is. You here are going to live for in eternity. The Bible tells us there is eternal life and there is eternal punishment. We have been made like God. We have been made eternal. And it's my decision, if I accept Jesus Christ as my personal saviour, the scales tip in my favour, favour, and God says, you are forgiven. Come on up. Even the worst sinners, as I've mentioned here before, many years ago in a cell back in Japan, I went down to the condemned men, men who are due to be hung. And one man said, I want to have God's forgiveness. He was hung a few days later, but that man is in heaven because of the goodness of Jesus Christ. None of us have the right to stand before God, but because of God's love, because of his kindness, he put Jesus on the cross in your place. It's now your decision to decide, what am I going to do with Jesus? And what that simply means is, I kneel before the Father, not literally, but figuratively, Lord, I want your forgiveness. I am guilty. I fall far short of your standard. I know that. Thank you for your love. I now accept your son, Jesus, as my substitute, as my saviour. I ask him to come into my life. And with the power of the Spirit of God, he comes into our life. And as we sang before, since Jesus came into my heart, all things have changed. They changed for me and they changed for many of you that I know whose lives were completely out of kilter prior to becoming a Christian. And God says to you today, what are you going to do with Jesus? We're going to sing a song at a moment, and it tells us that Jesus paid it all. If you're feeling bad, you think, yes, I don't have the right to go to heaven. You're right, you don't. But nor do I. Nor does King Charles. Nor does the Pope. And I don't have his garments like he has. None of us have the right, but God in his love and his kindness and his mercy said, I want you to come up. I'll pay the price. And God himself paid that price. All right, we're going to hand over back to Tim now and we'll sing Jesus Paid It All. Thanks, Tim. The song says, your strength is small. Is small. And uh, in the message this morning, we talked about <clears throat> Belshazzar was weighed and, and found to be lacking. But we can find in Christ our all in all. Let's sing together, Jesus paid it all.
close in prayer. Lord, we thank you that when we were lost, when we were sinners, when we were your enemies, Jesus came into this world and gave his life in order that we might stand before you in his righteousness, that we would be accepted in him. We acknowledge that we all fall short of what you want us to be. But we rejoice in the fact that Jesus paid the penalty that we might stand right before you. And if there's anyone here today who has not experienced that change in their life, that they don't know that Jesus has paid the price, I pray that they would not be too proud to acknowledge their need and turn to him before it's too late. Dismiss us with your blessing. May your grace go with us and help us to live the way you desire us to as your people in this world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.